There's no fighting this gracious rhythm. I lift my hands high, embrace to you. Now every time I go, I can't find the words to say.
changes, ever changes. You heard your children then. You hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answer prayers back then. You and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are providing. You are providing now. You are the same. You are the same. first time at Bonita Valley, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. If you want some info on BVCC, simply complete our online connect card. Here's how it works. Scan the QR code you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you with the camera on your smartphone. Open the link that will take you to connect card. You'll find a number of connecting options, including first time guests, prayer requests, I want some info on a Bonita Valley ministry check the appropriate connection box you're after. Push submit and we'll get back to you ASAP. And if you are a first time guest today, please stop by Guest Central at the end of this service and pick up a special gift bag we have just for you. We'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about some things coming up for you and your family at Bonita Valley. The Aspire Women's Conference is coming soon. We have an incredible opportunity to attend this one night, three hour evening of music, comedy and Bible teaching right here at Bonita Valley on Friday, September 30th from 7 to 10 p.m. Buy your tickets with BBCC Women at our special group rate of $20 for general admission or $30 for VIP tickets, which include early admission and a special Q&A with our speakers and artists. Tickets are available on our website under the Events tab or at the Welcome Center after today's service. Through Financial Peace University, millions of people have learned how to become debt-free and win with money. BBCC is hosting a nine-week course beginning tomorrow, Monday, September 19th. Childcare is provided. For more information and a sign up, visit benitavalley.com slash FPU.
Bonita Valley is partnering with an amazing ministry called Homes of Hope to build a home for a family in need in Tijuana. The dates for this ministry trip is October 6th through the 8th. Space is limited. All ages and skill levels are welcome. For more information or to sign up, click on Homes of Hope under the Events tab at BonitaValley.com. We believe God has entrusted us to be managers of our time, talent, and treasures. We believe He wants us to use temporary resources to make a real and eternal difference in our world. And that's what giving at BVCC is all about. When we give to God, we see lives changed and transformed, both others and ours. There are three ways to give at BVCC. Online at bonitavalley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 833-303-9325 or by mailing your offering to BVCC 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California 91902. During our Sunday services, we offer professionally staffed nursery that will lovingly care for your little one up to two years of age. We also offer an outdoor patio area and a family room with TV monitors for parents who choose to keep children under two years of age with them. Pastor Davida and her team lead incredibly fun ministries for preschool and elementary aged children in the Life Center gym. During today's service, you can take notes, sign up for events, and even give using your smartphone. Simply use the follow the service QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. I want to ask you this question, have you ever had a bad day? Like a really bad day, like a bad day, like a bad week, a bad month. You ever had a bad year? A bad two years since maybe March 15th, 2020? I don't know, it's a random date I picked out of nowhere, but sometimes we have bad days. And a few months ago, I was having a not so good day. Can I admit that? And I came down here into our, our sanctuary, and I was just going through my, my, my three favorite uh, scriptures that I pray and read through, which is Psalm 23, the Lord's Prayer, and the Armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And as I was finishing Ephesians chapter 6, and in that passage, I hit verse 18. And it just, sometimes you read scripture and things kind of pop up to you differently when the Holy Spirit just, just wants to speak to you. And and so verse 18, I, I hit that, and you can read this with me right now. And it says, and in and pray in the Spirit, Paul says, on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert, always keep praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So here I am. I'm having a bad day. I'm I'm, I'm sitting down there. I'm I'm by myself. and, And I'm reading Paul, and Paul is encouraging this church in Ephesus. And and yet Paul says, I am an ambassador in chains for the sake of the gospel of Jesus, which means Paul is in prison. I think Paul's bad day beats my bad day by, by at least a little bit. And yet I can tell as you read through the Ephesians, you can tell an energy, there's a happiness, there's a joy, and he's in chains. How is he so happy? And I'm, I'm considering it, I'm thinking it, and, and it hits me as I read it a second time. Paul is praying for everybody. So I sat there and thought to myself, you know, sometimes Jordan's good just to do what you see in the Bible, just simply do it. So I started to do it. I started praying for my, my mom and my dad. I started praying for my sister and my grandpa. And then I prayed for my coworkers and other pastors on staff. And I prayed for people who are in my ministries. And, and you know what happened? I started feeling happier. My, day, my bad day was going away. 
That's why the less you focus on yourself, sometimes it's the key. And this light is turning on and the joy of praying good things over others, it just hit me like this secret weapon of energy and, and joy. And sometimes now when, when I feel like I'm facing a battle and it feels like I'm having a bad day, praying for everyone, all kinds of prayers, fills my cup. And that's all I have to say today. Let's go and bow our heads and pray. We're, we're going to take off. We're, we're all done. That's it. I'm just kidding. Paul talks about prayer a lot. The beginning of the same book, the book of, of uh, uh, he speaks to the church of Ephesus, and he says in verse 15, he says, ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you a little bit. No, I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight that you might grow in your knowledge of God. There's a young pastor he's mentoring named Timothy, and what does Paul say to little Timmy? 2 Timothy 1 verse 3, he says, I thank God whom I serve, fast forward, as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Now, some of you are wondering if I have a smoking habit. It's not the smoking habit. I'm getting over the flu, so forgive my voice. There's a frog in my, in my voice. He's got friends in a church in a city called Rome. What does Paul say to them? Romans 1.9, God whom I serve in my spirit and preach the gospel of his son is my witness how I Constantly remember you in my prayers all the time. Man, Paul, Paul went through being shipwrecked. Paul was hunted. Paul was persecuted. Paul was accused. Paul was in chains. Paul, was, Paul had a lot of bad days. Those are a lot of the days I would not be doing well. And yet when you read Paul's letters, is Paul... Depressed. I can't tell. Now, that's not to say he never had bad days or he was never down. I would never, uh, never say that. But you can just tell that Paul has an energy that's driving him. Purpose is driving him. The call of Jesus is driving him. But praying for others, I'm telling you, I start connecting the dots. There's an energy to his life because he's praying for everybody, everywhere, literally all the time. When Paul says pray for all God's people, he's really praying for all God's people. His prayer list is longer than my grocery list. And praying all the time is one of the, the three key habits he practices. Watch this in 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Paul says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What's God's will? God's plan, God's desire, God's roadmap, God's, God's playbook. His playbook for your life is to rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in the middle of everything. Not for everything, but in the middle of whatever you're going through. And you know what happens when we do this, when those three things become more habits in our lives, you and I will become super charged and strong believers and Christians. It can supercharge us. Praying continually was not a homework assignment. He was not being religious. He was not going through the motions. He was praying from his heart for real people in real places and real circumstances, just praying good things for them. And it was a secret to Paul's cup being full. Even when he's in the dark, his light was still on. Now, most Christians don't think of themselves as being super spiritual. Most prayer warriors don't think of themselves as being prayer warriors. So if you don't think of yourself as being a prayer warrior, super spiritual, this word is for you. If you do think of yourself as being super spiritual, you need a whole other sermon to fix you. That's not how we should be thinking of ourselves. 
Number one today, though, no matter what circumstance Paul was in, lots of prayers kept his battery charged. And we've all been there probably almost every day where your battery's ticking down. You get a ba- battery cell phone anxiety. Every once in a while, somebody like I, someone I love, named my sister, will send me a screenshot. I'll see your battery's just like, it's always in red. I'm like, that girl lives on the edge. It's always almost going to die. Somehow she still answers the phone when I call her. Why do we need to understand that lots of prayers can fill our, our, our cup? We need to understand this. Why does praying all kinds of prayers on all occasions for all believers fill your cup of happiness? Here's why. Prayer connects the soul. Your soul needs connection. You were made for connection. Can I tell you something? One of the most unhealthy things we did during, during the worst part of COVID was disconnecting from seeing people and talking to people and being with people. It's one of the reasons why, why some of us pushed, just for those who may want to make the choice, obviously it's everybody's choice, but, but church, let me tell you, church was, is, and always will be essential. It is essential. I had some people argue with me, ah, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. It's always been essential. It'll always be essential. Let me tell you, t- t- church on TV is a blessing, but it's not enough. Church on the internet is a blessing. It's a tool, but it's not enough. Until you know somebody and their pain, and they know you and your pain, it's not enough. We need church. If you're watching, it is time to come back. You cannot have a virtual relationship and be the believer you should be. You need a real relationship with real people. They say the average Christian goes to church 1.2 times a month. There's four, sometimes there's five Sundays in, 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 in a month. And the average is 1.2. I don't know about you, I don't want to be average. And if you've ever wondered, does it seem like the church is losing spiritual battles in our nation? Maybe 1.2 times a month isn't enough. Maybe we're not setting, maybe we're not feeding ourselves. Listen, if you're the chef at home and, you, and you're going to deliver dinner for your family four times a week and your kids show up 1.2 times out of four, how is it going to make you feel? What kind of connections is your family going to have when, when food's being left on the table and you made it? And let me tell you, there is hours being prepped each Sunday for these ministry times for you. And when we don't show up, food is left on our spiritual table. I want to challenge you and your families and encourage you. Some of you are here every week. Some of you are here twice a week. Some of you are here three times a week. Some of you are here four times a week. Some of you are already in heaven and somehow you're here so much. (laughs) You're just walking in heaven, you're coming to church, you're back in heaven, you're coming. It's amazing, you're more spiritual than I am. But 1.2 times a month, that's not enough. Because we need to connect. We need to know one another. And prayer connects the soul. Before, but before there was a thing called cell phones, and we had this invisible network of connection, prayer was a network of connection. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not saying Paul didn't have challenging times. He certainly did. But prayer created a sense of connection as he prayed for his best friends. He did not feel so alone when he was alone. We could tap into a network of connection when we spend time praying for the church and for people. We need healthy people connections is the next thing in your notes. As Christians, we know we have a God-sized hole that only Jesus can fill, but some of us sometimes feel to recognize that we have a people-sized hole in our hearts that God made. You were not made to live on an island with the Bible and God all by yourself. You were made to be connected in a family and community. And God put that there for us. Studies have shown that when people are going through physical pain, 
They can tolerate, they feel literally, literally less pain when somebody is there holding their hand, the pain goes down. Then they're all by themselves. That's the power of human connection. We are literally stronger. We can endure more. We can go farther when there's somebody there somehow holding our hand. Dr. Henry Cloud is an amazing Christian psychologist and, and author. If, you're, if you need to get healthier in your relationships, in your life, read a Dr. Henry Cloud book. Listen to the Audible deal. Read Henry, Dr. Henry Cloud. Pretty much anything he's written, healthy relationships, better mentalities, Christian psychologist, he's, he's fantastic. And he's talking about, about his, uh, his brother-in-law. He'd always wanted a brother, didn't have a brother. But through his sister, he got a brother-in-law. He had his brother. And, and, and there was this time where he found out a story about his brother-in-law. who had he, he had become a Navy SEAL, but before he became a Navy SEAL. And becoming one is extremely difficult. And, and as one of the toughest challenges and tests to, to cross this line of becoming one, they're going through all this crazy stuff. And, and in the middle of it or at the end of it, they drop them to the ocean. And they got to swim the shore get on their feet and cross the finish line. And his brother-in-law swimming ashore and he is exhausted. And he gets to land and his body just collapses on, on, on the sand and he's just, he's just done. But one of his close friends is at the finish line and he sees his friend lying there and his friend yells, go! And he said, he said I, I, I don't know what happened, but I didn't even think. My body just got up, and I started running, and I, he crossed the line. And if he had not crossed the line, he would have been out. He was done. One friend says one word of encouragement, and his body had energy, and he crossed the finish line. It's the power of connection. The power of a teammate, the power of people, and a single word of encouragement. Ecclesiastes 4.9. <clears throat> It says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Verse 12, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Listen, have you ever needed to beat somebody up? The Bible says you'll have more success if you bring a friend to the fight. That's how I read it. So the cord of three strands is not quickly broken. We need real, healthy, dependable relationships, people we can rely on, people who can rely on us. It's why we have our weekly ministries. It's why we do... Tuesday night recovery and Wednesday prayer services and Thursday men's and women's group and, and collage on, on, on two Fridays a month and youth group for teenagers. And man, if you're a parent and you've got a teenager and they're not in youth group, what are you doing? Well, they don't want to go. Who, who cares? <laughs> but but they, don't, they, don't wanna, they don't feel like going, oh, who cares? You, you, who's the parent? Do, do you make them go to school? Yeah. We'll make them go to youth group. But, but, you know, their heart's not in it. Who cares? I mean, you don't control what they believe. You're the parent. You do control where they are. You control their environment. And if you don't control their environment, you're going to lose. Environment is, is so much. Your friends, the people you're around is so much. And there are some sick, toxic things going on amongst younger generations. You, you better choose. You better put your foot down. If you gotta bribe them, bribe them. If you gotta buy them a Starbucks, well, but I shouldn't bribe me to go to church. Why not? Like, what, what, what's a better way to spend your money on your kid than to put them in an environment where their soul might prosper. You can't spend your money in a better way. Are you kidding me? Bribe them. Mm. 
when I'm sick, I, I lose my mind. I'm sorry. I'm like, I get it wrong. A family of faith will always be essential. We need it. If you want to be connected and empowered, you need to be connected to a family of faith. Some people say, I I feel empowered when I wear a certain outfit because I'm turning heads and stuff. I I feel empowered when I I look good. Listen, put on that tiny little outfit when you're 85 and tell me how empowered you feel. (laughs) You are not empowered by what's in your closet. You're not empowered by what you see in the mirror. You are empowered when you're connected to a God who has a purpose for your life and you're doing life changing eternal differences in your world. That's what empowers you. Not the way you look. It's a, but I feel, yeah, you, you feel better. That's great. It's a great feeling. Nothing about it. But you can't build your life on that. At some point, you're not going to look great. No offense to anybody who's 105. <laughs> Paul stayed charged by praying lots of prayers for lots of people on lots of occasions. It's what empowered him. Number two, Prayer doesn't just supercharge us, it supercharges the church. Ephesians 6, 19 through 20, Paul again says, Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mysteries of the gospel. Underline fearlessly or circle that in in, in your Bible. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Watch this. Pray that I may declare it Fearlessly, some versions say boldly, as I should. So Paul's in prison. He's sending letters of encouragement and teaching. He's including prayer requests to the church. He's got chains on him. Can I tell you, if I'm in prison, and I hope I, hope I don't go to prison, but if I ever do, and I'm sending you prayer requests, you know what's probably on my prayer requests while I'm in prison? I'm probably, at, can you send my mommy? Can you send my blankie? Can you send me my favorite movie? Something to distract me, make me feel better. Someone can visit me. Can somebody break me the heck out of here? Get me out. Not Paul. Paul is sending massive encouragement and prayer requests. I would be asking for comfort. I would be asking, pray that the, the lunch ladies in this prison make me cookies today. Paul's not praying for cookies. Paul's praying for courage. And let me tell you really quickly, prayer requests, prayer requests, first of all, he's not sending emails or text messages. He's sending mail through an ancient mail lettering system. It's taking weeks, if not months, until they get this stuff. Do you think God is answering the prayers before they even receive them? I know he is. I know when when you ask him to pray for you, even if they don't pray for you, God hears it and God answers it. So there's a little secret for you. How do I know? I've seen it in my own life. Okay, can I, can, I, can I tell you another thing where I'm not perfect? Okay, every once in a while, people will say, Pastor Jordan, pray for me. And I'll go, okay. And they'll come back and I'll say, Pastor Jordan, thanks for praying for me. It changed. And I went, oh, stink, I forgot I didn't pray for them. <laughs> but I go, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> and, it, and it got answered. There's a moment in my, in, in my life where I was going through, through a, a, a tough season and a relationship didn't work out. And, and it was one particular night, and I don't know what attack I was under, but I, I, it was feeling, there's a dark cloud was over me. And this thought came to, to text uh, a, a good, good college friend of mine who was in another country and just asked him to pray for me. And, and, and it's, it's late at night, and I know he's sleeping because I know he's on the other side of the planet practically, and I write this text, and I press send. And the funniest thing happened. He didn't respond for three hours, but after I press send, this thing lifted off of me. I just sent a prayer request. Nobody prayed for me, and I felt an immediate change. Because prayer requests, God hears them. Even when they've not been seen yet, or prayed for, God hears them. Paul doesn't ask for comfort, he asks for perseverance. He doesn't ask for fun, distractions, he asks for fearlessness and boldness. 
<clears throat> reminds me, I believe it was, was uh, early this year, and uh, we're in a staff meeting, and Pastor Bernard from Uganda is here, and, and uh, we're praying for staff people, and uh, Pastor Bernard asked my dad, hey, can, how can we pray for you? And, and, and my, my dad hits this, this text where Paul asks for boldness. And, and his request is that we pray that he would have boldness when he speaks. So we gather around him and we pray for him. It just, just sticks in, in my mind. That you and I should pray for one another that we would have a spirit of boldness as believers in a dark world today. You need to be praying for your pastors. They've got to give us boldness. Pray for one another. Pray for yourselves. That there would be a, a strength of fearlessness. That when the time comes and God wants to speak, and it might not be an easy thing to say, that with grace and truth and love, we will say God's word. When you pray, you can supercharge the church by asking that God will give us boldness. Do you want boldness in your life? Or do you want to blend in? Do you want to be average? Or do you want to be a leader? If you want to be a leader, if you want to make a difference, if you want to step into heaven someday and want, okay, I, I did make a difference, you better be praying for boldness. You better be praying for fearlessness. Because God will deliver that. Number three, the enemy's plan <clears throat> always includes disconnection. The enemy's plan always includes disconnection. The enemy has a will for your life. And that part of it is that you would suffer disconnection in some of your most essential relationships. And you say, Jordan, I know God has a will for my life, but, but Satan doesn't have a will for my life. I, I don't believe that. Yes, he does. Satan always copies God. God has a plan. God has a will. God has a path. And, and Satan has one for you too. And Satan's plan is that you would suffer disconnection in relationships, that you would suffer wounds in your soul from your relationships that would tie you up and hold you down and hold you back because of trauma. Why does he want this? Because it makes us vulnerable, we feel alone, we more easily want to quit, we get more easily discouraged, depressed, far from our best. It's part of his plan. Satan's plan in the Garden of Eden was to disconnect Adam and Eve from God. Genesis 3, 9. After Adam and Eve have sinned and, and, and taken the fruit, God comes down, verse 9, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid. He'd never been afraid of God. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Listen, whatever you have, just bad, dark thoughts, who told me this? Where did this thought come from? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. <clears throat> when God came down looking for them, when he, and he said, Adam, where are you? Have you ever wondered why God, who knows everything, knows where everybody is? He knows where Adam is. Why would he say, where are you? It's because Adam was not the same person. The person God had walked and spent time with was gone. Adam was different. Sin had separated him, and it created disconnection between him and God, and not just that. Listen, Adam had eternal life. Adam, there was no plan for Adam to die. But Adam loses his connection with God. And not only God... Adam suffers disconnection from his wife. How do I know he did that? Because he blamed her. He blamed her. Okay, Boom, that was just been severed. And he blames her like a dummy. He was there, he saw, he heard, he ate, and he points at her. And married couples have been blaming each other ever since. 
It's the sin nature in us. It's why Jesus had to come to create reconnection to God's eternal life, to God's love for us, and connect us back to each other again. He came for all of it. John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance till the full, till it overflows. The thief came, he came with a lie. His lie always promises something greater, more power. He told him, you're going to be so much smarter if you take this. You're going to have knowledge. God's holding back from you. He didn't really mean you would die. And they, they, they bit into it. But Jesus came that we may have life overflowing, be reconnected to the source of all life. Satan's desire is to disconnect. Jesus, Jesus number four, came that we might be reconnected to God and to each other. John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he said. Without me, no one can go to the Father. Without me, no one can go to the Father. Some people read this and go, Why did he have to say this? It's so exclusive. Nobody wants to hear exclusive statements. Nobody likes that these days. It's 2022. Take it out. But what if he's saying something deeper? What if Jesus is saying, here's the truth. No one else is coming. No one else is. Is coming for you. This is the ship that God sent to rescue you. And just so you know, another ship is not coming. This is it. I've come to seek you. I've come to find you. I've come that you may have life. I've come that your life may overflow. And can I say that if you believe in a God who never came searching for you, is that a God worth Serving? Jesus is unique. Jesus is the name for God we use when we talk about the God who came to find us. And no other God has done that. Religion is always how man can make an effort to find God. Christianity is the story of God, how God came to find man and woman and reconnect them. He's a God who came looking for you. In Luke chapter 15, there's three stories of lost things. A lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost prodigal son. I'll read you a portion of each one. The shepherd goes to find the sheep that the woman looks to find her lost coin. is a very valuable coin. This is like a multi-thousand dollar coin she's lost. It's, it's part of an inheritance. The son, his father had lost two of his sons. And there's key things in these statements, Luke 15, 3 3 and 4. Jesus told this parable, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? He is a God who came looking for you. This shepherd represents God. Next, he is a God who searched deep for you. Luke 15, 8. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? He is a God who searches deep and hard until he finds you. Next, he's a God who came running when you came home. Luke 15, 20. The old story of this prodigal son he offends his father, asks for his inheritance, leaves for Las Vegas, not really, but kind of, blows all his money, has no money left, realizes he made a huge mistake, he's eaten the, the food of pigs, he goes, I, I, my, my, my father's servants have it better than I do. Verse 20 says, so he got up, went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, listen, how do you see things from a long way off? You're looking. 
You don't see things from a long way off unless you're, you're looking. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son. This is a picture of God. When you come home, God runs to hug you. And in this culture, the fathers wore these long garments. That's not good for running. It was not dressed to run. He didn't, have, he didn't have his Nike running shoes on and little shorts to run. He was wearing a, 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 a long flowing robe. He picks up his robe and he runs a long distance to find his son because he is a God who comes running when you come home. Number four, we see that he is a God who throws a party. I just lost my spot. Give me one second. Luke 15, 7. It says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents or turns to God than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. That's told in the sheep story. Similar statement, verse 10, a few, few later in the middle of, of the woman lost coin story. He says, again, in the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of of the angels of God over one sinner who repents or says yes to God. Heaven throws a party when we come home. That's the kind of God. He not only searches for you, he searches deep for you. He runs to you. And when you say yes to him, there are, there are balloons going up in heaven. Amen. Angels rejoice. God dances. There's a party happening when one person says, God, I, I need you. I need you to forgive me of my sins. I receive your son, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Next, through Jesus, we have every good thing we need. I want to invite the band to come forward. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, God has done it all. He sent Christ to make peace between himself and us. What is peace? It's being reconnected. And he's given us the work of making peace between himself and others. And it's our job to bring reconnection to others. He is a good God who offers us good things and a good life and eternal life. He is a good God who wants us to be charged and connected and prayed up and praying for one another. I want to ask you to stand. Just a little bit ago, we, we were singing a song about God's goodness. It might have been the first time you've heard it. And I want to invite you just to join the band and sing it just, just one more time. You are good and you can't be anything else. I want to invite you just to sing that. Let's pray one moment before we do. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you are good. And Lord, we take a moment to, just to speak those words over our lives, over ourselves, over our body, over our family, over our church, that you are good. We pray this, we sing this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ben, would you, will you lead us?
just sing that just, just softly? Just, just, just one more time, we, we, we sing. And you are good. You can only be good. You can't be anything else. Will you just lift your hands? You can't be anything else. You are good. You can only be good. You can't be anything else. You can't be anything else. Just one more time, one more time. We sing, You're good. As the band j- just plays that song just slightly behind me, here's what I want to do. Uh, we're at church. Um, I know we, we can do churchy things at church. You can be, you can be churchy at church. Can I get an amen? Um, here's what I want to do. We're, we're going to dismiss in just, just a couple minutes. If you're in this place right now and you got a prayer request, might be a need in your body, pain, sickness, might be relational disconnection that's just weighing on your soul, be a problem at work, finances. I want to pray for you before we leave. And I want to empower us as a body to pray for you. Will you lift your hand for a moment if you got a prayer request? You don't have to share it with anybody. Okay? Hands are up. Okay? If your hand's not up, here's your job. Move to somebody whose hand is up and like place a hand on their back. That means you might have to actually move your feet in church. It, it's close to dancing, but it's not dancing. It's not a sin. You can move out of your, you can move in your place. Nobody's moving, but okay. It's really important. Connection's important. Laying hands on people is important. It says in James 5, 16, or actually point five is, there's power when we connect with each other in prayer. James 5, 16 says, admit your faults to one another, Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest power of a righteous man has great power and wonderful results. Elijah was completely human as we are, yet when he prayed earnestly, there'd be no rain. No rain fell. None fell for the next three and a half years. Then he prayed again. This time it would rain, and it, and it did. It poured. And the grass turned green, and the gardens began to grow again. You don't got to be special to pray. So I hope there's, there's somebody next to you laying a hand on you. Pray these words after me. If you get the hand on the person you're praying, say this out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I take authority. I come into unity. I ask for faith. And I bless my friend. Heal their prayer. Heal their body. Pour out forgiveness. Give them your provisions. Meet their needs. Give them peace and encouragement and power. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.